Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender is widely considered a mixed bag. Reviews range from the greatest series to ever exist, all the way down to straight up unwatchable. A lot of you guys have noticed I haven't really given my thoughts on the series since it released. It's been a few days now and no videos have popped up, so here it is. I didn't want to do a massive review where I try to critique as many things as possible like a lot of other people do, that's just not my style. So today, we're going to be doing something just a little bit different. We're going to be going through the events of every single episode of Netflix's Avatar saying what changes are good, saying what changes are bad, but then we're going to be giving them a ranking, S being the best and F being the worst. So, let's get into it. Episode 1, Aang. Episode 1 of Netflix's Avatar is a very ambitious episode. It's essentially adapting 21 minutes of backstory along with 3 episodes of the animated series. They're doing this all within a 1 hour window, so it's pretty much action packed and it zooms by fast as hell. You can't even go a couple of minutes without seeing something insane. This episode starts off with them giving more context behind the war and why no one was able to help the air nomads during the attack. Fire Lord Sozin purposely feeds an Earth Kingdom spy bad information that the Fire Nation is planning an attack on the Earth Kingdom, so this Earthbender does everything in his power to get this message back to the Earth King. Sozin later reveals that his sights are set much higher. They're actually going to be attacking the Air Nomads. This would explain why no one was helping the Air Nation because the whole world was preparing to defend the Earth Kingdom. This is just a little bit different than the canon explanation that we got in the Avatar Legends RPG, which is that the Fire Nation actually attacked every nation all at once, so they occupied just a little bit of land in every nation but put the majority of their forces in the Air Nation. Both of these explanations work well. I was a little disappointed that Katara's narration was replaced with Kyoshi's, but it's not enough for me to really care, but it would have been a nice throwback to the original if they went that route. When we get back to Aang's life before being frozen, the cinematography is beautiful. Beautiful. The shot of Aang gliding down, bouncing between these poles, just puts a smile on my face. And yes, he is gliding. He's not flying like the bird app will have you believe. 20 million views by the way. Aang has literally done this in the cartoon, I don't know what these people are talking about. Getting to see all the other airbenders, even if it is brief, is just so much fun. This temple looks alive, and more importantly, it feels alive. The relationship Aang and Gyatso have in this version is different. Gyatso is aware that Aang needs to master the other elements and knows exactly what's at stake if he doesn't. So, he tells Aang this. In the cartoon, Gyatso's more like, Aang, I won't let them take you away from me. Again, it's different, but not bad at all. They even touch upon this later in episode 5, and we'll get to that eventually. The attack on the air nomads is a highlight of this episode. It's extremely sad and heartbreaking to watch. These people are fighting for their lives as their home is being destroyed. What really hits home with me is you could tell that if the firebenders didn't have the power of the comet, the airbenders would have easily won. Even though they were ambushed and outnumbered, they still would have won. Now would be a good time to talk about Katara. She's a bit more mellow in this version, She's no longer that hot-headed girl who has temper tantrums and shows amazing displays of power. She's a lot more shy and affected by her past. This plays a huge part later on with her getting better at waterbending. Some people don't like this version of Katara, but I tend to think it falls more in line with what a 14-year-old girl who has experienced these sort of things would actually be like. Sokka feels the same as his cartoon counterpart, just a little bit more realistic. He's now this overprotective older brother who makes sure everyone in the village is following the rules. A lot of people like to complain how Katara and Sokka found Aang, but for me, this works perfectly. They basically fall off their boat because the currents are too fast. Katara tries to retrieve the boat with water bending, but accidentally cracks open the iceberg, which shoots out this giant beam of light. And this leads me to the introduction of Zuko and Iroh. The Fire Nation characters get the best treatment in the show by by far, Zuko, Iroh, the 41st Division, all of them get expanded plotlines and great scenes. From their introductions, they're already setting up tension between Zuko and his men. Where they take this plotline later on might be one of the best parts of the show. And you kind of get a hint at what that plotline could be when Zuko speaks to them. Our mission is vital to the future of the Fire Nation. We will find the Avatar, we will prove ourselves worthy, and we will see our homes and families again. Or 
we will die trying. Aang and Katara probably get the most screen time together in this episode out of every episode. When Aang and Katara are talking, relating to each other, or just training together, that's when they feel their best. I truly wish we had more scenes like this. From here, events pretty much play out the same as the cartoon. Zuko invades the Southern Water Tribe, Aang gives himself up, but we do get some Sokka action, and amazingly, he doesn't just get one shot this time by Zuko. When Aang is locked up, we get this scene of him and Iroh. Some of you might not know this, but in the original cartoon, they actually didn't really have a plan of what to do with Iroh just yet. So he was kind of just this bad guy in the show for a little bit. This series gets the benefit of knowing what Iroh eventually develops into and becomes. So they've decided to add this scene of Iroh and Aang talking in the jail cell. Aang asks Iroh why the Fire Nation is doing all of this. Iroh answers Aang by telling him that some believe it's just in their nature, while others believe true stability can only happen under the Fire Nation's rule. And of course, Aang picks up on the fact that Iroh never said what he believes. It's small, but it's in line with what we know of Iroh. When Aang escapes to go find his glider, he ends up coming across Zuko's room, where he comes across Zuko's conspiracy theory board, along with a notebook that contains information on all of the past avatars. Aang steals this notebook so he can learn more about himself and also how to stop this war. This notebook becomes the whole reason the plot starts moving. Instead of Aang stumbling along to location to location and accidentally learning about the past avatars, this notebook finally allows him to have a purpose and reason for going to these locations. I see a lot of criticism online that Aang didn't enter the Avatar state on Zuko's boat, but the adrenaline dump that we just experienced in the first 21 minutes of this episode, I don't think we needed an Avatar state adrenaline dump moment right now. I will say this though, in my opinion, this is probably where the episode should have ended, but no, they took it a step further and went to the Southern Air Temple. When Aang comes across Monk Yatso's skeleton and enters the Avatar state, he displays so much emotion. It's one of my favorite scenes of the series by far. This time, it wasn't Katara that talks him out of the Avatar state like in the cartoon, it was flashbacks of Monk Gyatso calming him down. I think this worked extremely well. In the cartoon, Katara is calling Aang family and stuff like that to calm him down, but I think it's just a little bit too soon. Uh, it's kind of implied that they had just met a couple of hours ago, so saying someone's family, it just doesn't hit yet. I've watched this episode four times now. I'd say on my first viewing of it, it would easily be S tier, but now that I've seen it so many times, I'm gonna put it in A tier. Episode 2, Warriors. Zuko is absolutely furious his notebook is gone. It's hilarious. He keeps the same energy about this notebook being missing for multiple episodes. Going through the notebook, Aang learns about Avatar Kyoshi and how she's a master of the Avatar state. I'm honestly not sure why that's notable as every Avatar ends up mastering the Avatar state. Uh, it would be pretty weird if she wasn't. Sokka wants to go home and ditch Aang. He doesn't want to be here. He doesn't want to be a part of Team Avatar. But after some convincing, he decides to stay. We're working with eight episodes here. Eight very fast-paced episodes. There's not a whole lot of room to work with. Katara needs to start learning to waterbend, and they're definitely not taking a pirate detour. The way they solve this problem is by having Grand Grand slipping a waterbending scroll in Katara's bag, which seems to be the same one from the cartoon. Aang saying goodbye to Gyatso is a good addition. In the cartoon, it always felt just a little bit odd that he came down from the Avatar state, and immediately it was like, let's go ride some elephant koi. While the gang is Headed to Kyoshi Island, Zuko and Iroh are searching for any way to find Aang. One of the main problems I have with the Kyoshi Warriors episode is that Aang isn't an honored guest. When he gets there, the mayor is just like, fine, you can stay, just please stop begging. We don't really want you here, but like, I get it man, you, you can stay for just a little bit. Like, I get it, they want to stay out of the war, Aang's dangerous to have around, but in my opinion, they should be willing to give the Avatar any information he needs in order to end this war as soon as possible. When she eventually does let them stay, she makes it very clear that they need to leave in two days. Without Sokka having his whole sexism arc here, this episode definitely feels a little bit off. Suki no longer humors Sokka the way she did in the cartoon, and similarly, Sokka no longer thinks he's better than her and is falling for Suki humoring him. The whole situation is now, Suki is an extremely serious warrior and sees Sokka as an idiot for trying to claim their equals. This is when Zhao enters the picture. Zuko and Iroh have this weird thing going on where they don't want to tell Zhao about the Avatar, but they're kind of asking questions if he's seen any 
anything weird recently. It almost feels like one of those situations where you're trying not to offend your friend so you're just walking on eggshells. I know they're trying to fit Sokka's and Suki's romance into this, but it just feels so forced. Sokka is changing his clothes while Suki comes in and creeps on him just to tell him there's some food in the fridge. The main point they're trying to convey in this scene is that Suki is clearly interested in Sokka now for whatever reason, even though he was an idiot earlier. It just all comes across just a little bit weird, unnecessary. When Katara is training waterbending, she informs Aang that he should be training too, but he doesn't want to train because Gyatso is the only one who's ever trained him prior to this. After this, Aang and Katara kind of have this like brother and sister type moment here. It really feels like a missed opportunity to have Aang do a little bit of waterbending training. We honestly didn't even need to see him training waterbending if budget was an issue. He could have been like, okay Katara, let's train and then they cut to the next scene. After all, this is an adaptation of book one and book one is called Water and he never waterbends once. I do like how we're still getting these scenes of Katara explaining why she's putting so much hope into Aang. I'm glad that characteristic has stayed. Aang and Katara are searching for clues about Avatar Kyoshi but are unable to find anything. Aang sees his art of Kyoshi displaying a ton of power and it reminds him of his childhood. We see that Aang never really wanted to fight. He's always had this immense amount of power and has almost killed people around him time and time again. This does work as an explanation as to why he's scared to waterbend. He's scared of being unable to control his power yet again. It almost feels reminiscent of him losing control of the fire in the cartoon and burning Katara. So Somehow Zhao ends up finding out Zuko's been looking for the Avatar all along and also somehow finds out that he's on Kyoshi Island. Although I said I wasn't a fan of this depiction of the romance Sokka and Suki have, this training scene that they go through is good. Sokka's heart to heart conversation with her is even better. One thing I was worried about going into this series is that Sokka wasn't going to have as many non-bender role models to learn from. This series is shorter, the mechanist has a smaller role, Yue is a waterbender now. I just wasn't sure what they were gonna do, but this works. Sokka learns through Suki that being a bender isn't everything. In non-benders, they can compete too. It's just the will that matters the most. Aang meditates and speaks to Avatar Kyoshi, and Avatar Kyoshi is speaking on business here. She's lived for 200 years and she is sick of sugarcoating everything. I do like how she's straight to the point with pretty much everything. There's a few really good things happening in this conversation. Uh, Aang does need to know that being the Avatar is a huge responsibility and he does need to know that his friends will always be in danger because of this. But this whole vision stuff is just not it, man. Kyoshi being able to see the future is just wild. The fight choreography in this show always has me locked in. I'm glad everyone gets their time to shine in this episode. Even the mayor was doing her thing. Kyoshi being the one to save her village one last time was easily the highlight of the entire episode. The music playing in the background is just so good. This episode ends with Zhao forming an alliance with Zuko and immediately double crossing him, sending word to Ozai that the Avatar is alive. It's a lot more interesting this way. Zhao is no longer just Diet Ozai. Zhao feels a lot more like his own character. He's this bottom feeder looking for any way he can to get more power. My feelings on this episode are extremely mixed. There were so many amazing moments. There were a lot of iffy moments. This may be a hot take here. Episode 2 is going in C tier. Episode 3, Omashu. Introducing Azula into the series this early was a huge gamble. Sure, Azula is a fan favorite character and it might entice people to check out the series, but what can you really have her do that doesn't feel like a big waste of time? We're working with 8 episodes here and you've already cut and remixed a lot of stuff. Do we really want to waste time on Azula who's not supposed to even be here? This is the big question this episode is trying to answer. There is a group of people who are planning to kill Fire Lord Ozai and free the Fire Nation from his tyranny. They introduce a character who can help sneak them into the throne room to assassinate Ozai. Though honestly, I have no idea how or why they think they can even beat Ozai, even with all of them, but little do they know this is actually Azula and they've been set up. Then we see this brutal scene of Ozai killing all of them. Ozai informs Azula that Zuko has done the impossible and found the Avatar. Right now, Ozai is pitting the siblings against each other, which is a big change from the original where it felt like Azula was massively favored for being a natural genius at firebending. The most interesting thing about live action Ozai is that he feels like he actually cares a lot about 
about his children. He genuinely wanted to teach Zuko a lesson. Even if it was morally a terrible one, he still cared for him. He also wants Azula to improve. He's using both of his kids to elevate one another. It's an interesting take on Ozai for sure but I think I like it. Team Avatar spots who they think is an airbender in the sky, so they follow him. This leads them to Omashu. Since Zhao and Zuko are now on the same team, they're able to combine their resources in order to find out where Aang went. Right off the bat, Omashu is kind of a mess, but it's at least a fun mess. It's trying to cover four episodes of the animated series all within 40 minutes of runtime. Jet and the Freedom Fighters are here, the Mechanist and Tio also, along with Boomy, Zuko, and Iroh, not to mention the occasional Azula clip. This episode is packed with people, but somehow manages to feel boring at times, but also incredibly fun at others. There is just so many things happening in Omashu. There's Fire Nation spies, random explosions. The Mechanist and Teo essentially have the same exact plotline as the cartoon. The Mechanist is making weapons for the Fire Nation spies in Omashu, but there's one twist. The Freedom Fighters are on his trail and are trying to stop him. This is definitely not a bad way to combine these two plots together at all. Jet has been keeping an eye on the Mechanist for some time now, and he knows the truth behind him. While Jet and Katara are taking out Fire Nation spies, Aang and Teo have discovered that Jet is actually the one who's planted the explosions. Meanwhile, the Mechanist is teaching Sokka life lessons by showing him that he doesn't need to just be a great warrior. Instead, he has a natural talent for engineering, which can be just as impactful. Jet is helping Katara through her trauma and this makes her an even stronger bender and she's finally able to master the water whip. And now Zuko and Iroh have entered Omashu. You see what I mean here, things are moving so fast. While all of this is happening, we learn that Zhao and Azula are forming their own secret alliance. Aang, Sokka, and Katara all get into a giant disagreement. Katara doesn't believe Jet is behind the Omashu bombings while they don't believe the Mechanist is working with the Fire Nation spies. Katara getting angry here is actually the closest she's ever acted to her cartoon counterpart pretty much ever. It feels great to finally see her stand up for herself. When Katara storms out of the room, she immediately confronts Jet and learns the truth. Jet wants to assassinate the Mechanist, Boomy, and pretty much everyone with them, so Katara goes back to that same room yet again and informs everyone Jet's plan. So they all head off to go stop Jet, but there's one problem. Zuko's here. Aang and Zuko have a pretty creative fight here in the middle of a bunch of merchants stalls. Zuko can't use any of his firebending because if he does, the Earth Kingdom army would spot him and arrest him. You would think Aang would just mop the floor with him, but it's surprisingly pretty evenly matched. My favorite moment of this episode is when Zuko finds out Aang has his notebook and gets intensely angry, so he breaks his rule of no firebending. It's just so funny. His anger isn't that he needs to capture Aang no matter what to restore his honor. No, his anger all comes from the notebook. He's like, you have my notebook. It is so funny. Katara accomplishes her mission and saves everyone from the explosion. Zuko has to run away from the Earth Kingdom army because they saw the fire. Uh, Iroh saves his ass by shooting fire into the sky, so Zuko is able to get away. At the end of the episode, Iroh and Aang both get arrested. I have a lot of mixed feelings here. This episode is action-packed, but everything feels a little off from combining way too many plot lines. Maybe cutting one of the plot lines could have helped out with this. Uh, I'm gonna give this uh, a C. I think that feels fair. Episode 4, Into the Dark. One of the most redeeming qualities of this show is just seeing the characters do, well, anything. The dialogue can feel extremely clunky at times, character arcs are absent, but it all sort of gets masked by how likable and fun the characters are. This is one of those episodes that get carried by that aspect extremely hard. Aang and Iroh have been arrested by Earth Kingdom soldiers. This sets up a classic retrieval mission that Zuko, Katara, and Sokka must go on, but there's one problem for both sides. How are they going to get into this palace? Zuko goes the route of disguising himself as an Earth Kingdom soldier, while Katara and Sokka take the secret tunnel, which isn't supposed to appear until season 2, and this time around the secret tunnel takes them directly to Boomy's arena somehow. Boomy is different in this version of Avatar, and it upsets a lot of people. Me included on my first watch through, but on my second and third watch through, I found Boomy oddly refreshing this time around. Don't get me wrong, I love classic Boomy. I love how much he adored Aang in the original. 
In this version, Bumi is upset that Aang left the world a hundred years ago and was traumatized by the war. His entire goal in this episode is to teach Aang how to be the Avatar, and how as the Avatar, he needs to make impossible choices. This is a reoccurring theme that almost everyone in this series that meets Aang tries to teach him. Meanwhile, Katara and Sokka are going through the secret tunnel, also known as the Tunnel of Two Lovers. But there's one problem, their brother and sister. It's an interesting take on the tunnels, I can at least give them that. This episode focuses on the siblings mending their relationship as, well, siblings, uh, leaving everything out there and telling each other how they truly feel about the traumatic events in their life. This allows them to safely go through the tunnel. The Iroh portion of this episode is by far my favorite. While Iroh is captured by the Earth Kingdom soldiers and being sent off to a labor camp, one of the soldiers knows exactly who Iroh is. This soldier's brother was killed during Iroh's attack on Ba Sing Se. Honestly, this random soldier gives some of the best acting performances in the show. You can really feel how much seeing Iroh's face means to him and how much he despises Iroh. There's this line that he tells Iroh where he's like, you know nothing about loss. The show proceeds to cut to a flashback of Luten's funeral. While everyone is paying their respects to Iroh, Leaves from the Vine is playing in the background. Seeing everyone's emotions and hearing this song in the background, it gets me teary-eyed, I'm not gonna lie. The scene hits really hard. Zuko tries to remain formal when he's paying his respects, telling Iroh it was such an honor for Luten to die, serving the Fire Nation, but eventually he cracks too and tells him how he really feels. The climax of this episode is a combination of Zuko saving Iroh and Bumi fighting against Aang. Bumi's final lesson to Aang is that he needs to learn how to make tough decisions. In this instance, it's either save Bumi or himself. Eventually, Katara and Sokka make it here and get Bumi out of the way of the boulder, showing Bumi that you can save everyone. You just need to surround yourself with people that you can trust and rely on. I absolutely adore the ending of this episode. It's a flashback scene to when Zuko gets banished and Iroh is trying to go with him. Zuko tells him, hey man, I don't need a babysitter here, and Iroh replies with, how about a friend? This episode has grown on me a lot. Yeah, Boomy's not clever, his games don't play as a double lesson anymore, but Aang is still lovable, and Boomy's actor is really selling those lines, he's delivering them amazingly, and all of the Iroh stuff is what makes this episode so fun. Now, this is definitely a hot take. I am going to be placing this episode in B tier. If you would have asked me the first time I watched it, I probably would have placed this in D tier, but I like it a lot. It's really grown on me. Episode 5, Spirited Away. F tier. Moving on. Okay, but seriously, this episode is confusing with way too much going on that it's almost hard to find the right words to even talk about it. It's impressive that they took so many concepts from the original, mashed them all together in one episode, all while simultaneously missing the point of what made these characters so special in the first place. Heibai is mad that the Fire Nation is destroying this forest. In retaliation, he is taking people away from a nearby village. So Aang, Katara, and Sokka all travel to the spirit world to try to fix this. That's that's not really how it works, but whatever, we move. When they get to the spirit world, they meet Wan Shi Tong, who tells them to stay on the trail, but then Sokka and Katara get kidnapped by Ko the Face Stealer, so Aang has to go to Roku in order to learn how to defeat Ko, all while Zuko is working with June in order to find Aang? It's all so messy. Like, why is Wan Shi Tong even here? Shouldn't he be in the physical world protecting the library? They're just trying to do way too much here, and way too many plot lines have been jammed together. It feels like Heibai has just been completely sidelined to fit Ko into the story. I wish they would have just adapted the Ko plotline faithfully and left him in the season finale. This version of Ko doesn't even feel that threatening. Uh, he kidnaps people who are lost in the fog of lost souls and then eats them to later steal their face. Uh, without having to control your emotions around Ko, he no longer has that same fear factor that he originally did. The only redeeming quality this episode has is a scene Aang shares with Monk Gyatso. We learn that Gyatso is in the spirit world because he chose not to move on into the Great Cycle, because he knew Aang would need him one last time. They share this touching moment where Gyatso lets Aang know that the war, the genocide, it's all not his fault, and that even if he was there, nothing would have changed. Gyatso's monologue at the end, where it plays over parallels between Aang and the Fire Nation, is one of the best scenes in the entire series, but it's just not enough to save this episode from F tier. Episode 6, Masks. 
You wouldn't expect this episode to work as well as it does. If you were to come to me and say, hey, I'm making a live action Avatar series, but I'm going to combine the Storm and the Blue Spirit episodes, I would have told you that both of these episodes are sacred and you would need to have told those stories separately. But after watching this episode, I will admit that would be completely wrong. This episode develops the relationship between Zuko and the 41st Division, much more than the cartoon ever did, which might just be the best change that this series managed to pull off. Zhao has been promoted to Admiral and takes control of Zuko's ship. In this moment, the 41st Division's loyalty is being tested. Are they going to follow Admiral Zhao or be loyal to Zuko, who they've been with for three years? From their perspective, this whole time Zuko has just been awful to them. They're just not willing to risk not listening to an Admiral for Zuko's sake because of all the things they've been through. So Iroh has a talk with them. Meanwhile, Aang has made his way all the way to Crescent Island to talk to Roku. How he meets with Roku is a essentially the same as the cartoon. All of the guards are against him, but there's a friend amongst them who takes him to Roku. But there are two key differences here. Aang is only talking to Roku so he can learn how to defeat Ko and get his friends back. This has nothing to do with the comet. Roku tells him that he's never defeated Ko, but he did manage to steal something from him. He stole a Funko Pop. Just kidding, he stole a pendant of the Mother of Faces, who is Ko's mother. Ko is no different from anyone else in this world. He just longs for family. Apparently. You wouldn't have guessed it by just looking at him. It's not super clear why Roku stole this other than to emotionally wound Ko, which kind of seems pointless, but it is really cool to see some lore from the comics show up here. June has been tracking Aang this entire time, so when he gets out of talking to Roku, she is just waiting for him. One lick from Nyla is all it takes to take down the Avatar. It's a bit disappointing we don't get to see Roku take down the temple, or Sokka try to fake firebend to get into the sealed chamber. Uh, those moments are are definitely missed, but again, it's important to keep in mind that this is a remix, not a cover. Once Zuko finally has Aang where he wants him, Zhao takes him away right from underneath him and puts him in the stronghold. The blue spirit stuff was so much fun to see in live action, it's a real treat to fans of the original. A lot of the action scenes are one to one with the cartoon. I know I've said in the past I hate when they do one to one action scenes because most of the time it just doesn't work in live action all that well, but this time, it works, and more importantly, it looks good. I did not think they were gonna do this ladder scene, but oh my god, does it look amazing. When Aang discovers Zuko is the blue spirit, they decide to expand this plotline a lot. Instead of Zuko just running away after one word, they actually get to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Aang sees that there is good inside of Zuko and believes that one day he can be good. Zuko learns that Aang is just a kid and probably doesn't deserve to be treated the way he's been treated by the Fire Nation. In this moment, they start to understand one another more than ever. It's not until Aang brings up Ozai's lack of compassion that Zuko gets angry. This reminds him of the whole reason he got banished. Zuko is banished because he held back, because he showed his father compassion. Ozai viewed this as Zuko being weak and gave him the scar to teach him this lesson. Compassion is weakness, and never show anyone compassion. There was a really good scene added here. Ozai banished the 41st Division that Zuko stood up for in the war room with him. They were all banished to find the Avatar if they ever wanted to restore their honor and return home. When Zuko returns back to his ship, his men are waiting for him, showing him the most respect they ever had. It's assumed Iroh told them everything behind Zuko's banishment. It's such a touching scene and a great emotional payoff that Zuko deserved. After everything he's gone through, he deserved this. Aang returns the statue to Ko as a trade-off to return the villagers and his friend. The episode ends with Aang going back to talk to Gyatso one last time, but he's no longer there. A lot of people interpreted the situation that Gyatso was actually just a little bit in the fog and it was all fake, but this is how I interpret the whole thing. Gyatso's spirit was finally able to move on to the next stage of the afterlife. The only thing that was holding him back prior was the uncertainty he had with Aang. He needed he needed Aang to know it wasn't his fault, and once he was able to accomplish this, he was able to move on. This episode was amazing. It is by far my favorite episode in the entire series. It's going in the S tier. Episode 7, The North. Lieutenant G gets tricked by Zhao and gives Zuko information that he's going to be arrested the next day. Zuko and Iroh have a quick goodbye and Zuko hops in a small boat and sails away. By the time Zuko discovers the blasting jelly, it's too late, and he gets blown to smithereens, presumed dead. After all this time, the gang finally arrives at the North Pole where they meet with Master Paku, Princess Yue, and Chief Arnook. While the Northern Water Tribe looks fantastic visually, Yue's wig is just 
ain't it, man. Actually, maybe it would have worked if they dyed her eyebrows white as well, or fake eyebrows, I don't know. Aang informs Arnook that the Fire Nation is going to attack the North, but Arnook already knows. Him and Paku are hoping Aang will single-handedly repel the Fire Nation because they don't know that Aang hasn't mastered all of the elements yet. When they find that out, Paku makes it sound like Aang's an idiot for not doing that first, even though there really wasn't enough time. Aang says he's here to learn waterbending, but somehow we never get to see that or have anyone even offer to teach him, which is just great. Thanks, Paku. Zhao offers his condolences to Iroh over Zuko's death, and Iroh pretends to not know that Zhao orchestrated it. Zhao also reveals that Ozai has given him command of a massive armada that he will be using to assault the Northern Water Tribe. In the past, all frontal assaults on the tribe has failed, but this time, Zhao has a secret weapon. He has Avatar Kurok's Spirit Blade, which he plans on using to kill the Moon Spirit. Nice little throwback to the Kyoshi novels. The gang gets invited to a feast where Sokka and Yue finally get to talk to each other. Honestly, I really love their dialogue here. It's super relaxed. It feels pretty realistic. We also meet Han here, who is a lot different than the cartoon. This time around, Han is written to be a chill, friendly guy who raises Sokka up and shows him that he's valued. He's basically the ultimate bro. This this is a stark contrast to the cartoon where Han is a shallow jerk that only wants to marry Yue for the quote unquote perks. Another change is that Han and Yue aren't engaged against Yue's consent. Earlier in the episode, Master Paku directs Katara to the healing huts for training, and despite everyone's concerns, they did still keep the Northern Water Tribe's tradition of not allowing women to fight. It does feel a little bit weird that Katara doesn't even try to master healing, as that's something in the cartoon that would later lead to saving Aang and Zuko's lives. Aang wants to ask Avatar Kork for help in defending the Water Tribe, but Yue warns him that Kork didn't actually help help people when he was the Avatar and he was too busy in the spirit world. We later learned that Crook was holding back dark forces such as Ko, which I wish they would have expanded upon this just a little bit more, but we do learn because of the damage he sustained against the spirits that he can't help Aang. While Crook and Aang are talking, Yue and Sokka talk as well, and it's revealed that the white fox from episode 5 was actually Yue. Because she's part of the moon spirit, she's able to go to the spirit world in her dreams. Uh, this felt kind of weird and unnecessary necessary, but you do you, Yue. Yue also randomly confesses to Sokka by kissing him, which totally blindsided me, even knowing they would get together. Especially since she implied that she's been waiting for Sokka. I mean, she barely even knows him at this point. Sokka's luck with the ladies in this series has been Suki creeping on him and Yue confessing after two conversations. Not bad for him, I guess. During all of this, Azula is playing games with Ozai, who's pushing her and making her feel bad about herself and pitting her against Zuko. This upsets her so much that she demonstrates that she can now lightning bend, though it's not really clear if this is something she was trying to master or, or whatever. It's a little bit strange since in the original you needed to have calm emotions in order to lightning bend, while here she is extremely angry while doing it. Azula ends by asking Ozai to unleash her upon the world, to which he just smirks. While it is really awesome to see Azula lightning bend, I'm just not sure it was worth adding in all of these scenes when it would have been just as cool if not cooler in season 2. Katara confronts Master Paku about the whole water bending stuff and shockingly, Aang agrees with him. He agrees that it's too dangerous, not because she's a woman or anything, but because Aang doesn't want to lose her. I do tend to appreciate them showing this side of Aang, where he feels so much guilt over not being there to protect people that he's now trying to be overprotective and only rely on himself. It doesn't really help that literally every other avatar he's met at this point repeatedly tells him that he can only rely on himself. Katara and Paku end up fighting, and while the fight itself is cool, I feel like it doesn't really hold up to the original all that well. However, it is extremely faithful to the original fight. Seriously, go back and watch it and you can see they copied details like Paku seeing his reflection in the ice, Katara launching herself at Paku, but the pacing overall just feels a little bit slower and the amount of water that they can bend isn't nearly as large. They also removed the plotline involving Paku and Grand Grand, but honestly, that wasn't extremely relevant in the first place. The episode ends when Sut starts falling, which is a fantastic callback to the cartoon. I'm going to be putting this episode in the B tier. Episode 8, Legends. 
Katara continues to insist to Paku that she can help, and this time, she convinced all of the women in the tribe to come along. Paku also recognizes Katara as a waterbending master, which is a bit weird as she's completely self-taught from the scroll Grand Grand gave her. Katara kind of just becomes a master overnight in three different versions of Avatar now, so I guess there's no real amazing way to do this, but I guess this felt fine. Aang gets a warning from Crook that his spirit blade is near. Zhao reveals his plan to kill the moon spirit to Ira while they are traveling in the war balloon that Sokka helped design. Zhao also explains that the moon tonight is special, as it's the ice moon, and that it's the one night that the ocean and moon spirit come to the mortal realm. If I'm being completely honest here, I think the spirit knife and the ice moon are totally unnecessary for the plot and just overcomplicate things. Especially when you start to think a little bit deeper into this, like, how could have Zhao possibly perfectly planned all of this out when he had just recently been promoted to Admiral, like, the other day? Like, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And if it were going to make some sense, at least add the Wan Xing Tong plotline here to explain everything instead of just being a random character in the spirit world, which he shouldn't have- Momo then proceeds to have an extremely weird fake-out death, but Yue can heal him now in the spirit oasis. Hold up. Does this mean Momo now has a piece of the moon spirit inside of him? Oh my god. This was all just a convenient way to get Sokka and Yue here to progress the plot later on. While Yue is healing Momo, Zhao and Iroh land, and Zhao insists that Iroh identified the spirits. Of course, Iroh has no idea what form they could have possibly taken here, which honestly begs the question, why does Zhao even bring Iroh to begin with? Zuko finally manages to catch up with Aang and Katara. Sadly, we don't get to see him interact with the turtle seals when he's trying to get in. I do miss some of the fantastical creatures that got cut, though understandably they would be very expensive to CGI in. Katara fights Zuko and we get that classic Zuko line of, you peasant, you found a master, haven't you? Which is a cool line in the original, but here it makes no sense because Katara doesn't have a master, I guess you could argue she's her own master, but whatever. Aang rushes to defend the spirits, and we get one of my favorite Iroh lines, Whatever you do to those spirits, I will unleash on you tenfold. Except in this version, he says that line and then doesn't really do anything. The scenes of the waterbenders losing their bending really does hit hard though, as several of them appear to die. And then we get Koizilla. The transformation honestly looks amazing and so much more intimidating than in the original. When the original remastered music comes in, it's just so good. There's one thing I didn't really like here. By merging with the ocean spirit, Yue explains that Aang will permanently lose himself to rage as a spirit monster that endlessly wanders the earth looking for its dead partner. I feel like this was just a really unnecessary complication. One really amazing detail is that Yue is still able to waterbend after the moon spirit is dead, presumably because she has a piece of it inside of her. I sort of miss Iroh explaining to her what she needs to do, but this scene does still hit pretty hard. Yue revives the moon spirit, and Koizilla calms down. But the damage is already done. Tons of Water Tribe soldiers died, including our bro Han. Sokka gets some great character development here with Arnook, who explains that he was there to emotionally support Yue there at the end which was worth just as much as actually being there in the fight. The episode ends with Azula conquering Omashu and Ozai discussing the comet. Honestly, the episode was a little messy and a little overcomplicated at times, but Koizilla was so cool and the CGI looked amazing. It was a visual treat to look at. I think this episode deserves A tier, but like low A tier. Looking back on this series, did they do the original justice? And I'm gonna say yes. I thoroughly enjoyed this version of Avatar. The journey was so much fun, I've experienced it three times now. I think when talking about the live action, it's important to remember this. This is the Legend of Aang, and a legend is told differently by each who tells it.